you will take your Bibles and look with me in Numbers chapter 21. Numbers 21. Let's read together from verse 21 down to the end of the chapter. I want to speak with you about the victory that is assured the Lord's people over every enemy. Just as we sang the song, the banner of the cross, that is the banner that we rally under. It's Christ himself and him crucified. And we can expect being under that banner that there will be many enemies. We can expect opposition. And I believe that's what's expressed here in this story of the Israelites as they move toward the promised land. It has not been an easy uh, voyage. And uh, you could say, well, if, if it hadn't been for their unbelief, the Lord would have taken them directly into the land. Well, that's true, but as God's providence had it, they wandered for 40 years, but even if he had taken them directly in, there would still be these enemies that they had to, to would have had to deal with. Uh, I think there's a misconception in the, in the minds of many that if I just live right, do right, and be right, then all will be right. And uh, that's just the notion that comes from, from works religion. Um, you can be the Lord's and still be going through some very deep affliction and trouble and oppression and uh, there are enemies on every side uh, enemies within this old flesh and so let this be a message of encouragement to us uh, that the lord is called to himself and, and is truly leading us uh, through this life this this wilderness uh, how how can we expect him to keep us in the face of every enemy it says here in Numbers 21 and verse 21, And Israel sent messengers unto Sion, king of the Amorites, saying, Let me pass through thy land. We will not turn into the fields or into the vineyards. We will not drink of the waters of the well, but we will go along by the king's highway until we pass, we be past thy borders. Now you remember, these little kingdoms were all lined up one after another. Last time I had you look on your map, you could see where as they go up the, the east side of the Jordan River, they just come on one kingdom after another. These were little fiefdoms, but every man defending his territory. And so they'd already made this request to the king of Edom last time, and uh, he had refused, which meant that they had to go out of their way around. But now, Again, they come to a territory where they request passage, only this time the reaction's even stronger. It's not a matter of, of just refusing, but we see here in verse 23, Sion would not suffer Israel to pass through his border, but Sion gathered all his people together and went out against Israel into the wilderness. So the king of Edom just stood on his borders and, and guarded them to make sure they would not go through. Here, this king actually goes on the offensive. And he came to Jahaz and fought against Israel. And Israel smote him with the edge of the sword and possessed his land from Arnon unto Jabbok. These are two rivers that ran through that land, even unto the children of Ammon, for the border of the children of Ammon was strong. And Israel took all these cities, and Israel dwelt in all the cities of the Amorites, in Heshbon, and in all the villages thereof. For Heshbon was the city of Sion, the king of the Amorites, who had fought against the former king of Moab, and had taken all his land out of his hand, even unto Arnon. So Sion, this king, had become proud of what he had gained by by his own strength, if you will, in his mind. And yet, here now the Lord takes it all away from him, gives it to the people of Israel. Wherefore, they that speak in Proverbs say, Come into Heshbon, let the city of Sion be built. And So this wasn't just any old king. This, this man had made his name in battles and, and earned by bloodshed this particular territory. And yet, he forgot one thing. 
all of that was because the Lord had enabled him to, to do so. For there is a fire gone out of Heshbon, a flame from the city of Sion, and it hath consumed Ar of Moab and the lords of the high places of Arnon. That was a proverb in the day. It was like Saul has killed his thousands, David his ten thousands. There were, these were legends that came out of these, these battles. So even though he was a man of, a king of fame among a people, Yet here's the word of the Lord, verse 29. Woe to thee, Moab, thou art undone, O people of, of Kamosh. He hath given his sons that escaped and his daughters into captivity unto Sion, king of the Amorites. That's still part of the same proverb. We have shot at them. Heshbon is perished, even unto Dibon, and we have laid them waste, even unto Nophath, with, which reacheth unto Medabah. So this was the proverb glorifying this king Sihon uh, in, in his day. But then we read in verse 31, thus Israel dwelt in the land of the Amorites. Here was a very powerful king that the Lord overturned for the sake of this, this people. And then we read verse 32, that's, that's one king. And then uh, verse 32, Moses sent to spy out uh, Jezer, and they took the villages thereof and drove out the Amorites that were there. And they turned and went up by the way of Bashan. And Og, the king of Bashan, went out against them. And all his uh, people to the battle of Edrei. So here again is the second king, Og. Sion and Og. And the Lord said unto Moses, Fear him not, for I have delivered him unto thy hand and all this, uh, his people and his land. And thou shalt do to him as thou didst unto Sion, king of the Amorites, which dwelt at Heshbon. So they smote him and his sons and all his people until there was none left him alive, and they possessed his land. You know, you stop and think, what kind of world would this be that we live in were there no enemies? Such are the consequences of sin from the fall of Adam. That we can talk about a lot of things that are the consequence of, of the fall uh, with regard to death and disasters and wars and famines. But, uh, you know, think about enemies. If, if it weren't for the fall, there would be no enemies of God's people and there would be no enemies of God. Adam's sin is, uh, is a rebellion. And... Being sons of Adam, that means we're born into this world, rebels. We're born into this world, enemies, uh, at enmity with God. And it takes the grace of God to turn our hearts otherwise. Uh, if not, we'll be just like these that the Lord destroyed. That's always important in uh, reading these portions of, of Scripture. Now, there's a number of ways that we might approach this subject you know, we do have to be careful not just to think in terms of individuals who are giving us trouble. <laughs> Most of us, you know, when we talk about enemies, we all of a sudden start thinking of somebody that has been a kind of a thorn in our flesh, and, and boy, they're my enemy. You know, you can have enemies that are real or imagined. I don't, I don't believe that that's the sense in which we're to read this portion of Scripture. I... I you know, unfortunately, some have learned to use the Bible much in the way of witchcraft to where any time somebody opposes them, they're, they're quoting scripture against them. They use it as a, as a almost like a, a hex, a cross, you know, to, to, to ward off somebody from, uh, from uh, doing them some evil. Uh, you know, the Bible clearly warns us against seeking vengeance and doing it in the name of the Lord. And and there have been many wars that have been fought, many retaliations, many, uh, uh, you know, uh, acts of vengeance that have been done in the name of the Lord. When you stop and think about it, um, we have specific instruction from our Lord as to how we should deal with personal enemies. Uh, if you look over in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 4, and again, I... This is uh, for our instruction. It doesn't mean it's easy, but uh, if any of us are dealing with somebody that is a bully or that is 
you know, purposely set out just to make your life miserable for whatever reason or personal gain, uh, you know, what is to be our attitude? Well, here the Lord says in Matthew 5, 44, I say unto you, love your enemies. And again, this is impossible, but for the grace of God, but it's still the instruction of the word. Bless them that curse you and do good to them that hate you and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. So this is, this is uh, you know, what the scripture teaches with regard to any that, that might uh, for time stand opposed to us in, a, in any kind of personal manner. But I believe the point that we need to consider here in Numbers 21 is uh, more, has more to do with spiritual enemies with whom we're not to deal so kindly. You know, when it says love your enemies, well, actually Satan is an enemy of our soul. We're not to love him. Uh, the flesh uh, is an enemy. We're not to love the flesh. This world is an enemy. Scripture says we're not to love the world. So uh, you can see where there's a distinction drawn in Scripture between those that are that are true spiritual enemies with whom, we, with whom we're not to have to do and individual persons that from time to time may, may be a source of conflict in, in our lives. These are spiritual enemies with whom we're not to deal kindly. The world, sin, Satan, you know, all of whom, and the reason is because if left unattended, these would certainly bring destruction to your soul and to my soul, were it not for the grace of God. If you look over in 1 John chapter 2, and I, I see Sion, I see, see Og here as being types of these, these sorts of enemies that uh, actually wage war against the soul, would, would seek our destruction were it not for uh, God intervening. In 1 John chapter 2 and verse 15, it says, love not the world. Now, we live in the world. We, we use the things of this world as the Lord has provided them, but we don't set our affection on them. You know, it's, it's, it's not that money is wrong, but the love of money is the root of all evil. Uh, there comes a time where you become, you, you, you know, there's a fine line there where, where what you have, you begin to, to covet and greed sets in and you desire more. That, you know, there's the, that's why the scripture says with, with food and raiment, let us be content. Uh, but love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. The reason why the world pursues what it's, it does is because the, the love of the Father is not in them. They have no love for the Father and uh, left to themselves, they, they pursue their own lusts, their own desires. Because it says there in verse 16, all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh. All right, that's, that's covetousness. That's what this flesh desires. And then the lust of the eyes. What's that? Well, that's to be seen of men. It's what the, the eye lusts for. Uh, for example, the Pharisees did what they did, even in the name of religion, to be seen of men. That's the lust of the eyes. And the pride of life is pride of what we have. You know, people talk about their pride and joy, and they, they glory in, in things that they have. Well, just remember, they can be taken away in an instant. Our health, our wealth, uh, whatever situation of comfort you may be in right now, we don't build on these things. These things are not of the Father, but is of the world. It's the thing that the world pursues. You can see how the scriptures warn us. And then one other passage in 1 Peter chapter 2. I wonder if we, we see these enemies for what they are. Every bit as, as much as Sion and Og were real enemies to the Lord's people that people of Israel, uh, I wonder if we see uh, our sin, whether we see the world, the flesh, Satan, just as, as really and truly an enemy to the soul. Here in 1 John 2 
in verse 11, Peter says, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims. See, if you're a stranger and a pilgrim, uh, you're not going to hold tightly to anything. I realize here in Numbers 21, it says that Israel dwelt in their land, in, their, in those cities, but it wasn't a permanent dwelling. They, the Lord moved them on from there. They, they inhabited it for a while, but then the Lord moved them on. I believe that's how we ought to see every possession and every dwelling place that the Lord gives us here. Let's don't hold tightly to it. Uh, let's, we're strangers and pilgrims, and it says abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. It's a very real warfare, just like Sion coming out against Israel and, and Og coming out against Israel. Uh, there is a very real spiritual warfare. Paul said we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but principalities and powers and the rulers of, of darkness in, in high places. These are, it's a very real warfare. If you're the Lord's, that's why you have this struggle. As much as we know of the gospel, yet in our flesh, we, we struggle with ourselves. We struggle with what, what uh, you know, you, you keep trying to go back to a feeling uh, of comfort in the gospel many times when the Lord's taking it away because our comfort shouldn't be even in feelings. Um, you know, our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. That's objective. But everything else, we dare not trust the sweetest frame, the, the hymn writer wrote, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. And so it is a very real battle. Over in 1 Peter 5, in verse 8, uh, verse 7, well, you can go all the way up and start at the beginning, but verse 6, Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God. There's times of humbling when he will bring opposition, he will bring affliction, he will... He'll have to, through his word, speak to you even as he spoke to Moses. Fear not this man. Moses was a man like we were. Here, even though they had just had a great victory over Sihon, now when Og raises his head, why did the Lord tell him, fear not? There must have been some fear in his own heart. Maybe the Lord delivered me from Sihon now to, to finish me with Og. So we can get those kinds of thoughts sometimes. The Lord brought me through this, but I know he's, he's just waiting around that corner and, and there's going to be that enemy that's going, to, that's going to put me down. That's why it says here, humble yourselves and uh, he, that he may exalt you in due time. That's what he will do if you're his. He will exalt you. He will glorify his name. He will not destroy you if you've been bought by his son, casting all your care upon him for he cares for you. But then verse 8, be sober, be vigilant, because what? Your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. All right, so uh, this is the setting that we find here. And we can never hope to form any kind of allegiance or treaty with these enemies. Uh, I don't deal directly with the devil. <laughs> A lot, of, a lot of people think they can. They think that uh, you know, if we can just get a prayer group and join hands together, we're gonna we're gonna face the devil straight on. Adam, in his best state, couldn't stand to him. How on earth do we think that we're gonna ever ourselves deal with him? No. What do we do? We run to Christ. We run to Christ. Same thing with this flesh. Sometimes we get the notion I can beat this temptation. <laughs> I can, I can put this out of my mind forever. You've been struggling with a particular temptation or whatever, a weakness in this flesh, and so you decide to take it on yourself. Guess what? The more time you give it, the worse it's going to get. It's, cause it's going to be like a cat playing with a ball of yarn. Pretty soon that whole thing's a tangled mess. What do we do in temptation? Flee to Christ. What do we do in the face of, of, of opposition in any form? Flee to Christ. And uh, we, we can't deal kindly with it or think that there's reason. Uh, these are all motivated by sin and destruction. And uh, just like these enemies here of Sion and Og, they, these two kings who stood in opposition to the children of Israel, if they had been left to their own devices, they would have caused great harm to the people of Israel. But uh, these two battles that were fought, 
are given to us in Scripture, just like we saw in Bible class, remember Lot's wife. That pillar of salt that she became stood as a, a monument of warning. Well, here, these two battles and the defeat of these kings are used by the Spirit of God as a testimony of God's providential watch care over his people. If you look in Psalm 136, written by David many years later, but you see here in, well, begin verse 16. It says, To him which led his people through the wilderness, for his mercy endureth forever. This is a mercy. This is a testimony of God's mercy. He could have just given them over. I say he could have, but he couldn't have. They had been bought, see, symbolically bought by that Passover lamb. They were the Lord's. And, and if we're Christ, we've been bought. He will not give us over, even though we feel at times he might, but he will not give us over to the enemy, to him which smote great kings. A lot of times we think, well, uh, this situation, I've been through some, but this one's unlike any I've ever been through. Well, to great kings that he smote, smote it says his mercy endureth forever toward his people. He slew famous kings, <laughs> for his mercy endureth forever. And then you see in verse 19, Sion, king of the Amorites, for his mercy endureth forever. And Og, king of Bashan, for his mercy endureth forever. And gave their land for an heritage, for his mercy endureth forever. It just, everything is the mercy of the Lord, the mercy of the Lord. And you look back on your own life, how the Lord from the time you were born, has led you to this point, and how many spiritual enemies there were, and even from your birth, being born in Adam, being born in sin, in darkness, not having a knowledge of Christ, and yet the Lord Jesus by his death overcame all that and was pleased in time to give you his spirit and teach you of just how, how he had his eye upon you even before you ever saw him. That, that's a blessed truth. That's a blessed truth. So let me just uh, give you a few things to consider here. Uh, coming back to our text in Numbers chapter 21 uh, and, and verses 21 to 24, the first thing I'd have you to note here is that there are enemies with whom there can never be peaceful coexistence. Let's just, you know, lower expectations. Yeah, it's, even the scriptures say, as much as is possible, live peaceably with all men. But here are some instances where there is no peaceful coexistence. Uh, I know there's songs that talk about selling your soul to the devil for a price and all of this. Uh, sin, Satan, the world, this flesh are vicious enemies. And uh, you, cannot, you cannot expect to ever dwell peacefully with them. You know, Moses... Uh, initially, they, Israel says, verse 21, sent out messengers and uh, sought peace, but they received an unpeaceable response. And like I said, worse than the Edomites, because uh, the Edomites only refused them passage, but here Sion went with forces against Israel in the wilderness. And he went over his borders. He went outside his territory without any provocation on the part of Israel. And so he ran to his, his ruin. You know, uh, if we can just talk about motive for a little bit. Again, Scripture has something to say even with regard to Sion's motive. If you look over in Judges chapter 11, I love searching the Scriptures and finding the commentary of Scripture on Scripture. Because you can read a lot of commentaries and get a lot of different ideas. But uh, when you go to the Word, here's an example in Judges uh, chapter 11 and verse 20, where this is again rehearsed. This very same story is rehearsed. You can see beginning in verse 19, Israel sent messengers unto Sion, king of the Amorites. This, these were being told again and again to their children as part of their history, which is a good thing to do. You know what? You know what? When your kids ask you, why are you a believer? <laughs> Why, why are we here in this congregation? Why are we sitting under this message? There's an opportunity to tell them again and again how the Lord has brought you, how he delivered you, how he has brought you to, to, to know Christ. There's no greater testimony than, that, than we can leave 
with our children. And here, this is being rehearsed. Uh, the king of Heshbon and Israel said unto him, let us pass, we pray thee, through the land unto my place. Here's an example of as much as is possible. Let us live peaceably with all men. But Sion trusted not Israel to pass through his coast. But Sion gathered all his people together and pitched in Jahaz and fought against Israel. So Sion didn't trust the people of Israel. You know, most people are going to treat you like they, they know themselves to be. They, uh, they don't, they're not trusting. It's, it's hard for them to believe that the grace of God can cause a person to deal honestly with other people. That's just the kind of world we live in. Uh, you might have that in your workplace after you've worked with some people a while and you don't react the same way. And I'm not saying we're perfect, but there is a difference in how we deal with things and people notice. That's not the time to put your thumb underneath your lapel and think, well, I've, I've worked through these things and that's why I am what I am. No. Our testimony is I am what I am by the grace of God. But here, Sion didn't trust the people of Israel. Uh, he had no reason to mistrust them. They'd already passed through Edom. They'd already come around, showed themselves to be uh, peaceable. But his own thoughts were his own worst enemy and uh, actually brought about his demise in the end. So you say, how so? Look over in Deuteronomy chapter 2. In all of this, let's don't forget that even in wicked men's hearts and thoughts, God is at work. He'll, he'll use it for the good of his people and his glory, or he'll use it for their own destruction. As uh, Brother Jim read there in Ezra, how the Lord worked in the heart of the king of Assyria <laughs> to the favor of his people. Uh, isn't that what the scriptures say, that the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord to turn it whithersoever he will? He could use a Cyrus to set forth a decree to release the people, or he could raise a king up after his own thoughts and fears to go out after a people for the purpose of God's purpose to destroy. And that's what we see here with, with Sion. If you read in Deuteronomy chapter 2 and uh, verse 30, it says, But Sion, king of Heshbon, would not let us pass by him. Now here again, this is being rehearsed. We're in Deuteronomy now. Uh, being rehearsed again to the children of this generation that was, was being raised up. Don't ever tire of rehearsing these things with, with the next generation, with those that, that follow. We'll soon be gone. But if the Lord teaches them, they'll rehearse it to their children, you see. For the Lord thy God hardened his spirit and made his heart obstinate that he might deliver him into thy hand as appeareth this day. That, that'd be something we wouldn't know if the scriptures didn't tell us, but that's exactly what was going on. Here was a man that the Lord had purposed to destroy, and he was going to do it in a way that, that glorified his name. I think the lesson to be learned is that enemies of the church, such as sin, Satan, the world with its philosophies, they can, they, they'll never be subject to the truth. They'll always stand opposed to it, Always stand opposed to the, the grace of God. Always stand opposed to imputed righteousness because men go about to establish their own righteousness. That's what men do naturally, and that's why they fight in imputed righteousness because it's a righteousness of another, you see. And so uh, the only way to deal with them is death. <laughs> that any that do not bow, any that, that, that pursue their own course, there's only one, one thing that... that can be done, and that is the sentence of death. And I believe that's why the Lord Jesus Christ, the captain of our salvation, came and lived and died, that he might conquer these enemies. You, you notice how it's put here, the Lord delivered them into the hand of Israel. These have been delivered to us. These are blessings. We don't have to go out and fight this warfare. There's another that, that has done it uh, on our behalf because being delivered once for all. Uh, the, the sentence of death was, was put upon the flesh. The sentence of death was put upon Satan. Uh, the, the sentence of, of death was put upon every ordinance that stood against us that would have been for our condemnation were it not for Christ, the captain of our salvation, leading the way. All right, so, uh, and then you can, you can look at that and 
couple of scriptures. Let me just, I don't want to rush through this. I'll, I'll deal with this and then we'll pick this up next time. But Romans chapter 6. See, this is, this is the point here that there are enemies with whom there, there can't be peaceful coexistence. These are real enemies. And God himself, in order to deliver his people, dealt with them through death, the death of his son. They were dealt the death blow. For example, Romans 6, it says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? We're talking about sin being an enemy as much as sign and all. No, you can't coexist. You can't, there's no peace in, uh, in, that, in, in sin. God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? All right, you say, well, how are we dead to sin? We'll read on. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Now, I know a lot of times people read this and, and use this for water baptism, but look at the context. It's not talking about water baptism. It's talking here about the baptism of Christ's death, wherein he was put to death. He entered that grave, and he rose again. And if he died, he died for a people. So that means that those for whom he died, when he died, they died. And when he rose again, they rose again. That's where this matter was settled, you see. As it says here, therefore we're buried with him, as it says, by baptism unto death, in other words, by baptism in his death, by that very death that he died, we're buried with him, that as like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. God gives us life and causes us to live based upon what he, he did in his son. That's, what, that's the only reason Israel lived. That's why Sion was destroyed. That's why Og was destroyed. It was because of God's favor on that, on that people. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, I didn't actually die, but I was planted in the likeness of his death in that when he died, I died. That death sentence was already taken, has already taken place. We, also, uh, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him. Now, what's the old man? That's who we are in Adam that condemnation that we, that was ours in Adam, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin or be under its legal condemnation or bondage. For he that is dead, verse seven, is freed from sin. You know what that word freed is? I don't know if you have a marginal reading or not in the Greek, but it's actually the word justified. For he that is dead, he that died when Christ died, is justified from sin. You can't find a clear passage of scripture that declares how and when our justification took place before God. It's when he died. I wasn't even there, but that's exactly the point. That's the grace of God. It's not, it's not me, it's him. It's him. And it's on that basis that God has called me to himself by his spirit, revealed Christ in me, and keeps me today, and will keep me all the way to glory. It's because there's one who's fought this battle already and destroyed every enemy, done away with it. <laughs> and I can, I can go forth in peace. You know, that's, that's, what, uh, that's what this is all about. Also, just take a look here in Colossians chapter 2, and then I'll, I'll come back to this. There's a lot in this portion that I want us to look at, but I will draw a line here today anyway. Colossians chapter 2. And verses uh, 12 on down to verse 17. Again, you see this image of baptism. Again, water baptism is an ordinance. But what is it about? Well, it has to do with us having died with Christ. And been buried with him. And him having put away our sin by his death. It says, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised us from the dead, raised him from the dead. You see, it's all related to Christ's death. If, if I've been made to know Christ and given his spirit today, it's because I, I died and was buried and raised with him when he died and was buried and raised. 
And it says, and you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, here it is, hath he quickened together with him. That word quickened together at one time is so important here. It doesn't, it's not talking about our individual regeneration. It's talking about when he rose again. See, I was dead in my sins in Adam. But so complete was the work of the Lord Jesus Christ that when he rose again, I was, we were all, all that were in him, all for whom he died, were quickened together with him. Look at here. Having forgiven you all trespasses. When did forgiveness take place? Well, when he put, up, put away my sin. See that? And, and that's what the rest is about. Blotting out the handwriting of the ordinances that was against us which was contrary to us and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. When, when Satan begins to put in your mind and thought, you've got to do something for forgiveness, what do you do? That's old Sion coming out fighting against you. That's Og coming out there trying to defeat you. You look to Christ. You, you read this word and you think, now wait a minute. I've got a title deed here to Christ based upon what he accomplished. Uh, I'm not going to sit and fret about me doing something for forgiveness of sin. Christ did it. Christ did it. See, that's, that's where we look. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. It's a battle, no question, but it's been waged and won. That's why Isaiah 40 says, Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people. Tell them that the warfare is over. It's not something that we're all in here fighting this thing out, trying to make it. No. Christ our our captain has, has done it. And therefore, let no man judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of any holy day or the new moon or Sabbath day. Don't let them bring you back under laws and conditions for any sort of standing before God. It says here, that they were but a shadow of things to come, but the body is in Christ. There's our hope. Christ, Christ alone. Well, we'll... Uh, Leave it there, and Lord willing, I'll pick up with this again next time. There's, there's a number of other points I want us to see about, about these enemies, and uh, I just want to make sure we walk through it uh, carefully. Let's have a word of prayer. Our gracious Father, I do thank you for your word. I thank you for the instruction that's in it so plain and clear, and I pray that you would, by your grace, cause our eyes to look to your blessed Son love, Find in him our peace, our all, our, our satisfaction, because you're satisfied in him and what he's accomplished for the salvation of sinners such as we are. Just uh, commend each one here uh, to your mercy and grace. And we ask, Lord, that you would tenderly lead us along. We give you praise in his blessed name.